Comrades, brothers and sisters, fellow Singaporeans. First, let me congratulate all the recipients of the party awards. You have all contributed much to the party in your different ways. Some of you are young activists committing energy and passion to the party, like Comrade Chua Wei Shan from West Coast Branch, who's receiving the Youth Medal. She is Assistant Secretary of the Young PAP Exco, and as Assistant Secretary, she organizes activities to bring together YP activists and unionists from the NTUC. And all this while starting a family, because Wei Shan became a mother last year. Congratulations. Other recipients have served faithfully for decades. Comrade Asya Masnawan from Bukit Panjang branch, who is receiving a dedicated service medal. She has been a volunteer for 37 years. And Comrade J. Tanabala Singam from Siglap branch, better known to her friends as Mrs. Bala, who is receiving the Gold Award today. She is 90 years old and still active. Both Asya and Mrs. Bala are at MPS every week without fail, helping their MPs and mentoring new activists. Yet others are being recognized for their leadership, like Comrade Stephen Lim from Tluk Blanga, who is receiving the Commendation Award. <laughs> Stephen Lim has chaired the Tluk Blanga Branch Election Committee for three successive general elections and each time successfully. <laughs> Leading the list of recipients is Comrade Lim Boon Heng, receiving the Distinguished Service Medal. <laughs> there will be a full citation later, but I must say a few words here. Boon Heng has served the party and Singapore loyally and with distinction for four decades. Comrade Go Chok Tong brought him into politics. He was first elected MP in Kebun Baru in 1980, and he was re-elected there twice. But Boon Heng was a warrior, and therefore we sent him into the toughest fights, to Ulu Pandan in 1991 and to Jurong GRC in 2001. And each time, he answered the call of duty and won important battles for the party and for Singapore. In all, Boon Heng contested seven general elections until he retired from active politics in 2011. Boon Heng was a key member of both ESM Go's team and mine. I have benefited from his shrewd advice and staunch support over many years, ever since I entered politics in 1984. He was in Kebun Baru, I was in Tegi. We were neighboring constituencies in Ang Mokyo town. Boon Heng works quietly behind the scenes. He gives credit generously to others and dedicates himself completely to the party's cause. He served as party treasurer and later on as party chairman. Even though he's retired as an MP, he continues to render signal service to the party. He helps to identify promising candidates to join the cause because he chairs the committee which interviews potential candidates before they appear before the SecGen's committee, which I chair. And I value his assessments, his probing, his overall judgment of what the person says and what the person is. Boon Heng is also a good operator. He mentors the PAP teams in Aokang and in Aljuni GRC. And he had a lot to do with the election result in 2015, when the, our PAP team in Aljunit came within a whisker of victory, winning 49% of the vote. So congratulations to Boon Heng and all the other award winners once again. It has been a busy year for Singapore, both domestically and internationally. 
As chair of ASEAN, we've kept up a heavy schedule of events and meetings, culminating in the ASEAN summit next week. It starts around 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. It's actually a series of more than 10 meetings, plus four official or state visits on the sides by Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia, Premier Li Keqiang of China, President Vladimir Putin of Russia, and Vice President Pence of the United States. And immediately after these ASEAN meetings, I'll be traveling to Papua New Guinea for the APEC, and then a week later to Argentina for G20. In addition to all this, we've had several major external engagements this year. We hosted the Trump-Kim summit in June. French President Macron invited me to be guest of honor at the Bastille Day Parade in July. In October, I had a bilateral retreat with Indonesian President Jokowi in Bali. And we've just hosted the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, which is a major conference bringing in many global and business leaders from around the world, including Vice President Wang Qishan from China and Dr. Henry Kissinger from the US. And, of course, Mr. Michael Bloomberg himself, who may be a presidential candidate. All this activity has not only kept MFA and the other ministries busy, it's also advanced cooperation with our partners, especially our ASEAN partners. And it has been an opportunity for us to fly our flag internationally and raise Singapore's standing in the world. While we focus on making progress and solving problems in Singapore, we must also track what's happening in the world, how external events will affect us, what trends in other countries mean for Singapore. Many countries are under serious stress. Their electorates are anxious, frustrated, often angry, for various reasons. Often, people feel their lives are not improving. Perhaps the economy has grown, but the fruits of growth have not been evenly distributed. So income gaps have widened. Some people see their lives stagnating. And there's anger and frustration among those who have been left behind. In the countries which have generous welfare benefits, people are finding that the bill is coming due and has to be paid now. That's an unhappy matter. Often, immigration is a hot-button issue. It was so in Britain, led to the Brexit vote. Or in Germany, where Chancellor Merkel has a policy, had a policy of open door to refugees. And one million refugees came in. It provoked a violent response. It caused a drastic loss of support for her party, the Christian Democrats. And it has forced her to step down as party leader. In America, immigration is a hot issue too, but it has been compounded by social change. And in particular, one group, the non-college educated white voters, are anxious because they fear that other groups, the blacks, the Asians, the Latinos, are catching up and overtaking them or gaining influence and social standing at their expense. So they feel a loss of identity. They resent it. They fear losing their place in the social order. They used to be middle class, at least middle middle class. Now others are getting ahead of them. And they don't know what to do about it. They don't see anybody fighting on their behalf. So many of them have become strong supporters of President Trump. These countries face difficult economic and social challenges, which they haven't found adequate responses to. So the politicians make irresponsible promises during election campaigns. And after getting elected, they openly admit that these promises cannot be kept. The populations become alienated and divided. The voters lose confidence and trust, not only in individual leaders or particular political parties, but in the whole elite class and in the whole political system. So the mainstream moderate political parties lose ground. And the groups which come up 
and emerge are radical groups, protest groups, extreme groups, like UKIP in Britain, like AFD in Germany. When that happens, the politics becomes polarized and poisonous. It makes it even more difficult to solve the country's problems. And the country goes into a downward spiral. Singapore is exposed to similar stresses too. We also worry about economic disruption, loss of identity, social stresses from immigration. Although fortunately for us, these challenges have not been as, as extreme as for other countries. We've coped better than most than other countries. This is not just our good luck but also the result of the deliberate choices we made and the hard work we have sustained for generations. The policies have worked, people's lives have improved. And the PAP has been upfront and honest with Singaporeans. We've shared with you the challenges and concerns, what we need to do together to overcome them. And therefore, the party has maintained the trust and support of Singaporeans, of voters, We've been able to unite people and to make further progress together. But we should not take what we have for granted. We don't have a magic charm to keep us well and safe. Can divisive forces take root in Singapore? Of course they can. Can politics go wrong in Singapore? Of course they can too. But we must do our best to prevent this from happening. And that means getting both our policies and our politics right, because good policies and good politics reinforce each other. I often talk about policies, how we are addressing people's concerns, what goals and breakthroughs we are aiming for, for example, at the National Day rallies. But today, this is not the National Day rally. This is a party conference, so I'm going to talk about politics. How to maintain good politics in Singapore so that we can continue to do the right things and keep on improving people's lives? That is a sacred purpose of the PAP, the reason why we exist. There are four things which the PAP must do to keep politics right. One, we must understand the concerns of Singaporeans, show that we are doing our best to address them. Two, we must give people hope for the future, confidence that their lives and their children's lives will continue to improve. Three, we must encourage inclusive politics to keep Singaporeans united. And four, we must provide capable and good leadership both for the party and Singapore. So there are four things. One, understand people's concerns. Two, give people hope. Three, bring people together Four, provide good leadership. First of all, we must keep Singapore's, Singaporeans' concerns foremost in our minds. What are people worried about for today and tomorrow? What are different groups concerned about? What are their hopes and dreams for themselves, for their children? If we understand people's concerns well, then we can respond in a targeted way, work with them to address the specific problems and worries, and give them confidence that together we can make things better. Many governments' policies are aimed at solving people's concerns. For example, building more HDB flats to shorten HDB queues so young Singaporeans can get married, set up home, and start their families. Enhancing preschool education, raising the quality, increasing the number of places so young people, young parents can be relieved of one major worry when they raise a child. Improving healthcare finance, Care Shield Life, Madeka Generation Package, and so many other items so that seniors do not fret over burdening their families with medical costs. Working with employers and unions on skills future to deepen workers' skills and match them to new jobs. But beyond these individual policies, we need to connect the dots 
to paint the overall picture for Singaporeans so that people get the broader message. And the broader message is that the government understands your concerns, that the PAP is working with you to tackle problems together, and that whatever your difficulties in Singapore, you will never walk alone. And to do that, we have to complement good policies with a human touch. And this is where every party activist plays his part. The party organization and our networks are crucial. Every one of us, MPs, branch committees, activists, volunteers, every one of us who works day in, day out in the branches and the constituencies amongst the people and on the ground, when you work the ground, when you touch people's lives, you give the party a human face. When you show up week after week at M MPS, you're not just helping to write letters and send them off to HDB or CPF board or some other government agency. But you're offering residents friendship, encouragement, so that they identify with you, trust you, confide in you, help you to help them more. When you go door to door on house visits, you understand the resident circumstances and needs, and you can explain how exactly they can make use of government policies to personally benefit themselves. You can show young parents how to use the marriage and parenthood package to lighten their financial load when raising their children. You can explain to retired residents how the PG package or the Merdeka generation package will take care of their health needs in life, later in life. By showing voters that you personally care, it convinces them that the PAP cares, that the PAP government cares. I know your work is not easy, it will be tiring, sometimes even discouraging. But we are all here today because we count it a privilege to serve. And each person we succeed in helping, whose life we make better, even by a little bit, it makes it all worthwhile. Secondly, beyond showing that the PAP cares, we must imbue Singaporeans with hope about the future. In the early years, life was hard, but people were hopeful because the economy was growing rapidly, taking off, and a whole generation of Singaporeans witnessed their lives improve dramatically. We no longer enjoy the same spectacular growth rates but we can still achieve steady and sustained growth. And this enables our people to look forward to good jobs, better standards of living. Recently, Comrade Taman used escalators as a metaphor for how our society should work. He emphasized how we must keep the escalator moving up so everyone on the escalator has a chance to do better. And if the escalator ever stops, we will all be in trouble. Because then, instead of everyone striving to move up, you're competing to move up a bit more, or maybe not quite so much, perhaps some faster than others, we'll be fighting over who moves up and who has to move down. And we see such games of snakes and ladders in other economies which have stagnated. Then the fight over who is up and who is down becomes much nastier. That's why we must keep our economy growing, and that means pressing on with economic transformation. Already we can see some early successes. Companies, big and small, are restructuring, embracing technology, retraining workers. Our startup scenes warming up. For example, in fintech, where homegrown companies are doing well. High-tech industries, Robotics, aerospace engineering, digital farming have sprouted here. And we are attracting unexpected investments. For example, you may have noticed recently that we are going to have a car factory in Singapore. It's very odd. We had car factory in Singapore many, many years ago. The Ford Motor Factory, and then it operated after the war for a few years. It closed down 40 years ago. But now we are going to have a car factory again. Same, same, but different. 
What is different? It's Dyson. They make very advanced electronic electrical devices and they are going to make electric cars in Singapore. So we are back in the same industry but at a different level in a modern high-tech form. And it will create jobs for Singaporeans. So it shows that with technology and a skilled workforce, we can overcome our traditional constraints of scarce land and higher labour costs and create new and exciting opportunities for everyone. We must also plan and think ahead for the long term so that Singaporeans know that we can look forward to a better future. Of course, no one can tell for certain what the next 50 years will be like. We live in a troubled world. But all the more, we must plan ahead so that come what may, we are prepared the best we can and we have options and solutions to deploy. That's why we are making huge infrastructure investments. Changi Terminal 5, the Tuas Megaport, many more MRT lines. That's why in the National Day Rally, I talked about HDB leases as well as HIP2 and VERS, programs which will only start several decades from now. That's why we have CareShield Life, MediShield Life, CPF Life, to prepare Singaporeans in their prime now for the day far in the future, when they're old, when they're retired, when they will need more health care. It's a paradox. We don't know what the future is going to bring. All the more, we have to plan for the future. I was asked this question at the Bloomberg conference on Tuesday. A lady stood up, says, it's such an uncertain world. What do you do long term? How can you plan for the future? I said, I don't know whether we'll have war and peace or peace. I don't know what will happen in the region. I cannot say how climate change will affect us. But all the more there are things we must do now to make ourselves more resilient, not just not tomorrow, maybe not even next year, but years, decades from now, generations from now, so that we are ready whatever happens. And I listed some of the things we did. And I think people took note that in Singapore, we are able to do this. We can think ahead, we can plan ahead, we can do ahead, and we will get there. One important aspect of getting there, of hope, is social mobility. I talked about this recently at PA's Kopi Talk, post the NDR. Not only must the country as a whole prosper, but people must believe that they themselves have every chance to improve their own lives, and especially their children's lives. And that's why we put so much emphasis on education and learning, starting with preschool to bring every child to a good starting point and continuing into skills future and workforce upgrading to give every worker the opportunity to keep on upgrading himself. We want our people to have many chances to improve themselves and to do well in life, whether they are early or late developers, whether they come from rich or poor families. And that's what meritocracy is about helping each other reach the best of our ability, not holding back others who have the potential to do better than ourselves. We cannot cut tall poppies down. We must encourage every poppy to grow. And it will be different colors, different heights, but we will be one community, one Singapore, succeeding together. Beyond education and meritocracy, we must maintain the egalitarian spirit in our society. To, we must be able to interact freely and comfortably as equals, to have respect for one another, regardless of income or status, never to look down on others or push our weight around. Without such a social ethos, social prejudice and barriers to mobility will gradually harden. You will look at somebody, you feel, no, he's not my class, he's not on my side. Maybe he's not deserving to be taking on a job. 
or she is not deserving to be taking on a job. We will be unfair to our people, we will block their opportunities, we will do worse for ourselves. So we have to be able to work together to be informal with one another, ping chi ping zuo. We sit together, we rise together, we are on the same level. We feel a kinship, a comradeship. And that way, we can all be Singaporeans together, one nation, making for a more cohesive and much happier society. Cohesion doesn't come naturally and easily to any country. Every society has its tensions, has its contradictions and fault lines, which have to be managed, but especially so in diverse Singapore. Therefore, my third point is that we must keep Singaporeans together and encourage inclusive politics. The PAP aims to represent all Singaporeans, regardless of race, religion, income, or to a large extent, even your ideas and your preferences. Our supporters have to accept our party's core values, honesty, multiracialism, meritocracy, self-reliance. Those are fundamental, they will not change. Our party members must embrace our goal of building a fair and just society where the benefits of progress are spread widely to all. That's what the PAP was created for. But on many other issues, PAP members can and do hold different views across the whole spectrum. Some are conservative, others are liberal. Some want to keep the PSLE exam, others favor scrapping it. Some want to retain Section 377A, others want to repeal it. I won't talk about all these subjects today, it may be several lectures, but regardless of these differences, all can be good members, loyal members of the PAP. And it's important that the PAP is able to bring these different groups and opinions together. The party aims to be a broad tent, a broad church. We may not be able to reach consensus on all issues all of the time, but we should always try to find common ground and more importantly, to maintain a shared space where the different views can be aired constructively, can engage, and can engage in a way that does not erode trust and social cohesion. Only then can Singaporeans unite to create happiness, prosperity, and progress for our nation. If we fail to, to expand this common ground, if we fail to maintain this shared space, our society will gradually become polarized. The middle ground will weaken, wither away. The extremes will grow. Politics will have to follow and become a zero-sum game, organized along the fault lines in the society. And this sort of politics will only make the fault lines deeper. And then people will be forced to take sides. You're either for me or against me. In America, the politics is so deep that when families gather, they cannot talk politics. In fact, it's reaching the point where a Democrat family said, we'll have a view if some young member wants to marry a Republican and vice versa. It's like between Romeo and Juliet. Different clans, different tribes, different nations. And in that situation, a party like the PAP trying to hold everybody together will have a very tough time because a centrist party will not easily be able to bring people from the two ends together. The differences will be too deep. And if they lose ground, extremist protest groups, radical groups, populist groups will gain ground. And once our society goes this way, we are in that downward spiral and it will be practically impossible to rebuild centrist politics again and bring Singaporeans together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, fallen down, finished. 
It has happened to many countries. It can happen to us too. I hope Singapore never becomes this way. We must never allow the differences between us to polarize our society. When there are disagreements, we must try to resolve or at least contain the differences. Don't let them poison our overall relationship. And the PAP must strive to reconcile different views and interests and work hard to strengthen confidence and trust between different groups so that we can keep this a society with a broad middle ground, multiracial, multireligious, tolerant, progressive. One salient example of how we bring people together is tripartism. Employers, unions, and the government, we each have our own interests, our own concerns, just like in any other country. But in Singapore, all three can work harmoniously together because we have built up trust and confidence amongst the tripartite partners over many years, and all three understand and uphold the national interest. Comrade Melvin Yong told me, I suppose he's both comrade and brother Melvin Yong, because he's in the NTUC, that when he goes overseas to attend trade union conferences, he brings along a standard presentation. He has his, his standard speech, 17 slides, and he presents the slides, how NTUC works in Singapore, what it does, and his audience is often puzzled. And they ask him, why are you doing this? That's not the union's work. That's the employer's business or the government's business. But after he has explained and they have understood how our system works, many of them envy our approach and what we have achieved. So when we talk about maintaining cohesion and centrist politics, it may sound ordinary and dull, but in fact, it's vital for Singaporeans, and it's very rare in the world, and it's a key reason why we've done better than most. And at the core of that is the PAP symbiotic relationship with the NTUC, and that's why today all of us are in white, but we have a group of people in NTUC colors today. And we th welcome them, thank them for their friendship, their partnership, and their support. My fourth and final point is the importance of the party providing good leadership. To understand people's concerns, to give people hope for the future, and unite people towards common purposes the PAP must have good leaders. And Singaporeans must have confidence that the party has good men and women who can take the country forward. They must know that the PAP comprises men and women who are not here for themselves, but to serve Singapore. And that includes every party member, from branch activists to CEC members, to the Secretary General and Chairman of the party. This year, we are holding a very important CEC election. It's a major transition point for the party. Five senior CEC members are stepping down. Comrades Kobun Wan, Teo Chi Hien, Taman, Jakob Ibrahim, Lim Sui Se. Jakob and Sui Se retired from the cabinet earlier this year. They've made many significant party contributions. Jakob as vice chairman, Sui Se as treasurer. Jakob has strengthened the party's support from the Malay community and assured Malay Muslims that they are treated fairly in a multiracial society. His ward, Kolam Ai, is where he grew up and lived. And his GRC, Jalan Besar, has been vigorously contested in every general election. But Jakob and his team held the GRC each time, five times in a row. Compared to other men in white, Sui Se is same, same, but different. <laughs> Having started off with the NTUC, he's kept his union links. He did much to strengthen tripartism, especially during the global financial crisis. 
but his biggest strength is his ability to relate to ordinary Singaporeans, not just with the folksy, vivid slogans that he coins, but with his amazing persuasive skills that he uses for the most difficult of issues face-to-face -face with residents. And I told him, we will video you, we will put you on YouTube. He says, not the same. You have to be there, you have to sense it, you have to engage, they have to feel it. I said, I will make you an avatar, hologram. <laughs> One day the technology will be good enough, we will be able to do that. Boon Wan, Chi Hien and Taman are stepping down from the CEC too, but they are staying on in the cabinet. They are three of my closest comrades in arms. We go back a long way. We fought many battles over the years and gone through countless ups and downs together. Each time we had a difficult challenge, Boon Wan has stepped up to tackle it, whether it's healthcare, housing, or transport. Each of these is a major policy area and also a very hot political potato. But Boon Wan made progress on all these difficult problems, at the same time explaining to the public what he was doing, showing them that things were in good hands, persuading them to be a patient a little longer because things are getting better. As party chairman, he didn't make many fiery election speeches, but his work between elections helped enormously to make sure that the party delivered on our promises and therefore that we got good election results. Taman has played a major part in shaping our new ec economic and social policies, whether it's helping SMEs to upgrade their productivity or coming up with a special employment credit scheme to help older workers stay employed. He produces not just the ideas, but also vivid ways of explaining them, talking about trampolines and escalators leaving with one word a clear impression of the essence of what we're trying to do. Ji Hen and I have worked together the longest since our days in the SAF. He knows me as well as I know him, and he has given me wise counsel on the most difficult problems. I rely on his independent judgment and steady support on many matters. He doesn't hesitate to tackle spiky issues and to take political flag on behalf of the team, especially at critical moments and during elections. I cannot do justice to the contributions of these five retiring CEC members this morning in this speech, but all five have served the party with loyalty and distinction, and for that we owe all of them a big thank you. Today, we take a major step forward in our political renewal. After these CEC elections, the new CEC will meet within a couple of weeks to elect a new slate of office holders. And in due course, I will follow up with changes to the cabinet lineup. The PAP has had two smooth political transitions, providing both continuity and renewal. I launched ESM's authorized biography recently. He recounted how Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had brought him and the other two G er leaders in early and put them into key ministerial positions to master the intricacies of government policies, but more importantly, to learn to work together as a team, to develop their own leadership styles and to earn the confidence and trust of Singaporeans. It wasn't easy for the 2G team to fill the shoes of our founding fathers. And it was particularly daunting for ESM Go, or for anyone, for that matter, to succeed Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. But quietly and confidently, ESM Go and his team forged their own path, bonded with a new generation of Singaporeans, and carried the ground. When it was time for my 3G team to take over, the transition was equally smooth and sure-footed. It was a non-event, as it should be. The 4G team has been in Cabinet for several years now. Many of them joined in 2011, 
Some joined earlier, others in 2015. They've been tested in several portfolios. At the same time, they are working with each other and learning to complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. It is a team of able men and women with a good combination of skills amongst them. They are gaining experience, willing to serve, and most importantly, with their hearts in the right place. I can see them gelling as a team, and I'm confident that they have what it takes to lead Singapore. I hope that you will join me in giving your wholehearted support to the new CEC and to our 4G leaders. We are more than midway through this election term. This may be the last party conference before the next general election. The new CEC will be leading the party into the final stretch, gearing up to put our record before the voters. The PAP must win the next GE convincingly. And we will do so, as we have always done, by uniting Singaporeans, not dividing them, by bringing people together, not by deepening the fault lines and pulling people apart. We take a pragmatic and centrist approach in our politics and our policies. We serve every Singaporean, from Ang Mokyo to Al Junid. And we are setting a clear direction, supported by the broad mass of Singaporeans who want to see stability and progress continue for many years. Let us stay on course, maintain party unity in purpose and convictions, work with Singaporeans to give them and their children opportunities for progress and a better life, and in that way earn the right to continue serving our country and our people with you, for you, for Singapore, for many more terms. Thank you very much. <laughs>